Sin. Everyone's favorite word. To many, this word is either a dirty word or an outdated term from centuries gone by. For others, this word is the power that some spiritual leaders use to manipulate their followers. It's a death sentence and the reason we are sent straight to hell if we commit a single transgression. Yet others may not even have a concept of what this word is or what it means and only connected to major acts like murder. Whether you're clueless about this word or it's been used to bludgeon you into submission, this video is for you. What is sin and how do we know if we've committed a sin? A proper understanding of this one word could change your life. Let's take a look at this word together in this episode of One Word. Shalom Torah Tribe, welcome back to my series One Word. We all throw around words like faith, love, grace, repentance, salvation, righteousness, holiness, etc. We all think we know the meaning of them, but do we really? The goal of this series is to take a look at the Hebrew behind words that are tied to our faith in order to find a deeper, richer, and often unexpected meaning of these words than we ever knew. And knowing these meanings would have the power to change your life. The Cup of Redemption Messianic Haggadah is for disciples of Yeshua who want to have a meaningful Passover experience that deepens their understanding of Yeshua and His final hours before His death and resurrection. It's focused on clear instructions and includes additional articles explaining various components of the Seder. It also works to connect with the various elements of Yeshua's last Seder with His disciples. The Cup of Redemption Haggadah is great for anyone who wants to celebrate Passover in their homes, and it's also a great Haggadah for your congregation. It answers questions like, why do we drink four cups of wine? What do we dip and when? When did Judas dip into the same bowl with Yeshua? Why is there an egg on the Seder plate? Should I use horseradish, romaine lettuce, or something else for the maror? The Cup of Redemption Haggadah has something for everyone. Grab a copy for everyone at your Seder table. It's a great memento for the evening and something that will continue to be a resource for your guests long after the event. You can order your copies using the link below this video. First, let me say that today's topic is big. We could spend several episodes unpacking various aspects of this word and correcting poor teaching on the subject. I think I struggled more writing out the content for this video than any of my other previous videos. There's just so much to cover that I feel it's going to be incomplete if I don't hit on every aspect of the word. So please know up front that this video will not cover every aspect of this important topic and will leave several things unaddressed. Hopefully it will at least help you have a better understanding of the topic and be able to grow in your understanding from here. Let's begin. What is sin and how do we define it? Is something a sin simply because I feel it's wrong or have we been given the parameters of what sin is? Fortunately, we haven't been left fending for our own when it comes to knowing what sin is. The Torah spells it out for us. Paul tells the community in Rome, if it had not been for the Torah, I would not have known sin. This is Romans 7.7. 7. Even though many people have misunderstood what Paul is saying in Romans 7 over the years, we can all agree on this one thing. The Torah provides the very definition of what sin is. Therefore, at the very core, sin is violating God's commandments that are found in His Torah by either acts of omission or acts of commission. And if the Torah says, thou shalt not steal, then stealing is an act of commission that would violate this prohibition. If the Torah says, honor your father and mother, then not doing so is a sin of omission. To neglect the Torah's instructions that apply to us in any way is a sin. However, we need to realize that many of the Torah's laws only apply to specific people or cannot be fulfilled outside of a temple context. But now let's talk about the various types of sin. In our English Bibles, we generally don't see that there are various Hebrew words used to represent the concept of sin. But in fact, there are primarily three Hebrew words for sin. We can actually see them used to cover the entire spectrum of sin in the Yom Kippur ritual. Once the Kohen Gadol has offered up his own bull and slaughtered the first of the two goats, he is to confess the sins of Israel onto the second goat. In Leviticus 16.21, we read, 
Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities, this is the Hebrew word avonot, of the people of Israel and all their transgressions. This is the Hebrew word pishehim, and all their sins. The Hebrew word chatotam. This is Leviticus 16, 21. In this passage, we see the three categories of sin. The chet, the avon, and the pesha. The Talmud in Yoma 36b explains the meaning of each of these words. Let's take a brief look at what each one of these means. The most common Hebrew word for sin in the Bible is the word chet. In our previous video, we discovered that the word Torah comes from an archery term that means to shoot toward a target. Interestingly, the word chet is also an archery term that essentially means to miss the mark. So, by extension, a chet is simply a mistake or an error. You were aiming for the target, but you shot too low or you released too early. You missed. No big deal. This is a chet. The next type of sin is the avon. Avon carries the concept of going astray. To continue using the example of an archer, it would be something like seeing a squirrel and shooting at it instead of the target. And avon is a sin that has caused us to stray. Pesha, however, is more serious than either of these. It's a willful transgression a person does in order to spite God. It's essentially rebellion. If we kept the archery motif going, it would be like turning around and attempting to shoot your archery instructor. Not good at all. A sin that falls into the category of Pesha comes from a heart that is bitter towards God. And although all these definitions are general guidelines to help us understand each of the types of sin, these definitions do not hold true 100% of the time. The exact meaning of each word can only be determined by the context in which they're used in the scriptures. But knowing these general terms can help us to get an idea of what these terms may be suggesting as we encounter them. Another general word for sin you may hear is avera. Although not found within the scriptures, it appears many times in rabbinic sources. It comes from the same root as the word Hebrew, as in a Hebrew man or Hebrew woman. The Hebrew word for Hebrew, think about that for a minute, is the word Ivri. While at first this doesn't sound a lot like avera, if we take a look at the root letters, it becomes much more clear. Both words, Ivri and Avera, have the root letters Ein, Beit, Reish as the root. This root word, Avar, means to cross over. And Ivri, a Hebrew, therefore, is one who has crossed over. Crossed over from what, you may ask? Most likely, it was originally referring to the Jordan River. Being related to this word, you might say an Avera is something that has cross the line. It goes too far. In a sense, it trespasses. I know this is a lot to take in, but it's good to have these words in your toolbox so that you can refer back to them when you're studying the related topics. So, I have a question for you. Are all sins the same in the eyes of God, or do different sins have more weight than other ones? I'll give you a moment to think about that. But I was taught that all sins were equal and that any type of sin whatsoever would send a person straight to hell. But this isn't actually true. It's not what the Bible teaches. 1 John 5.17 says, All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. Wait, you're telling me that I can do whatever I want and get by with it? No, that's not at all what I'm telling you. All sin comes with consequences, but not all sin is a ticket to the lake of fire. Let's take a look at a passage from the Torah that explains how certain sins were dealt with in the time when the tabernacle or the temple functioned. Leviticus 5, 1-7 says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, If anyone sins and commits a breach of faith against the Lord by deceiving his neighbor in a matter of deposit or security or through robbery, or if he has oppressed his neighbor or has found something lost and lied about it, swearing falsely, in any of all the things that people do and sin thereby, if he has sinned and realized his guilt and will restore what he took by robbery or what he got by oppression or the deposit that was committed to him or the lost thing that he found 
or anything about which he has sworn falsely, he shall restore it in full and shall add a fifth to it and give it to him whom it belongs on the day he realizes his guilt. And he shall bring to the priest as his compensation to the Lord a ram without blemish out of the flock or its equivalent for a guilt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord, and he shall be forgiven for any of the things that one may do and thereby become guilty. Again, this is Leviticus 5, 1 through 7. In this case, someone intentionally did something wrong, but then had remorse over what he had done. First, he must make things right with the one whom he sinned against. In this particular case of theft, he restores what he stole and adds a fifth of the amount to its repayment in order to compensate the injured party. Once he had made things right with his fellow, he could bring an offering to the temple or the tabernacle as an act to restore his relationship with the Lord. Lest there be any misunderstanding, there is no cost for sin in regard to sacrifices. If this were the case, a person could weigh out the cost of whatever despicable deed they wanted to commit and see if they felt that it was worth it or not. Mmm, mug an old lady? No problem, I can afford that. Rob a bank? Hmm, well, that's a little bit more expensive. Do I have enough cattle for that? Put a bounty on your business partner's head? Hmm, I think I can figure out a way to make this work. It's actually ridiculous if you think about it. You don't pay for your sins with sacrifices. Sins have to be dealt with through the process the Torah outlines in the passage we just reviewed. The process of dealing with sins in the Torah is the same process Yeshua speaks of in the Sermon on the Mount. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. This is Matthew 5, 23 through 26. Well, why do we even sin to begin with? What makes us sin? Is it the devil? Not necessarily. Most of the time, it's simply our flesh that drives us to make poor decisions and go in a direction that is contrary to what our soul desires. The enemy may hold out the carrot, but it's ultimately our own choosing that's to blame. James, the brother of our master Yeshua, taught, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. That desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. This is James 1, 14 and 15. I mentioned earlier that not all sin leads to death. Well, James seems to disagree. But what he's speaking of is different. What he is saying is that if the small sins aren't caught and dealt with, they can open up the door for larger, more deadly ones, ones we never thought we would entertain. King Solomon said, It's the little foxes that spoil the vineyards. Whatever we yield ourselves to will eventually become our master. Paul reminds his disciples of this principle when he writes to the congregation in Rome. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness." But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Messiah Yeshua our Lord. Romans 6, 16-18 and 22-23. This is a principle worthy of meditation. If we give in to even seemingly harmless temptations, it will plant the seeds of sin inside us. Once they've been planted and left unchecked, their roots will grow longer and deeper, becoming more and more difficult to remove. And even though we may think we may have everything under control, we'll start to see the fruit of those seeds making their way to the surface. 
Well, what do we do if we've already reached this point? Actually, that's the topic of my next video in the series. It's called repentance. And God willing, we'll talk about this very soon. But in the meantime, we need to guard ourselves against the influences sin may have in our lives. David, the man after God's own heart, said, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. This is Psalm 119, 10 through 13. Dig into the word and have it ready to use to strengthen your flesh in times of weakness. It's not a sin to draw near to God. Well, that wraps up everything for this episode. If you missed the first video in this series on the meaning of the name of Yeshua, you can check it out right here. If you want to check out one of my other videos, just click on whatever YouTube has selected for you right here. We'll see you next time with another one word that could have the power to transform your life. Blessings from Amet HaTorah.